unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise God. Praise God. Somebody shout Amen. Genesis chapter 32, verses 24. Genesis 32, verses 24. And Jacob was left alone. Somebody say left alone. Bible tells us Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against the man, praise God, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the daybreak or the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And the next verse says, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Somebody say, Amen. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. What is your name? And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Somebody say, Amen. He what? Blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now this is a very wonderful scripture, if you think about it more intricately. A story you know very well of a patriarch in faith, this man called Jacob. The Bible tells us you know very well that he was called Jacob, meaning the supplanter, the thief, the trickster. And twice he cheated his brother. Of his what? Birthright and of his what? Inheritance. Praise God. The scriptures tell us that in that period, Jacob fled because he knew that Esau was going to kill him. Praise God. And then he fled away. And when he fled away, he encounters a blessing, a success of sorts. Not as much as the one that he ought to have, but a basic success that gave him children, gave him animals, gave him a family. He was a happy man. But then a time comes of reckoning and he has to go back to the place of reconciling with Esau because there was very bad blood between the two individuals. And a time comes when he has to face his brother and he has to be a man. He had that Esau was coming. He knew that the last time they separated, he was supposed to be killing him. So this was a man in trouble, trying to seek the favor of God and blessing and grace of God before his brother Esau. Scriptures tell us, before he meets Esau, he took his wives and his women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the fort Jabok. And he took them there and he sent them over the brook and set over where he had. So at one particular point, that very night he was, he was, he got his family, his children and all, and then put them afar off. And he separated himself for a certain while. And that is why now the Bible tells us that that was the time Jacob was alone. Praise God. There are certain things you can't fight with a crowd. Tell anybody there are certain battles you can't fight with a crowd. There are certain battles people can never fight for you. Even those that love you so much, there's a place where they can end when it comes to the things of warfare. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
And like you know how to fight in a corporate environment, of groups of people together in a corporate sort of prayer, and a place where you have to call a brother, and some of you have prayer, prayer partners, which are okay to have, you understand? But there is a place where a prayer partner cannot take you. I'm not saying I'm against prayer partnering. I'm only saying that there are places a prayer partner cannot take you. Because God did not call you with that prayer partner. It is okay for you to have a prayer partner in life. It's okay for you to have somebody you can share your pain with. And then melt affections and sentiments. And then pain. And then you pray together and thank God and believe God for the great things to come. That's okay for the miracles to happen when somebody comes and joins you in prayer. It is scriptural. It is biblical. He says if two or three pray, touching, agreeing upon anything, that thing shall be what? Established. That the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word is established. We know that. The point is that God believes oh, in, in a place where you, you, we can jointly pray together. Praise God. He believes in the duo, the trio, the many-sidedness of prayer. He believes in us coming together to pray together. But again I say, there comes a point where, even though two are better than one, there also comes a point where sometimes you will find yourself alone and certain battles you have to fight alone with God. Somebody shout hallelujah. You can run to people, but they also end somewhere. That's why we cannot put our trust in flesh. For it fails. Somebody shout hallelujah. You remember the time when the Christ gets the pillars, James, Peter, and John. He takes them for prayer. He tells them, you know what, tarry and pray with me here. You understand? Because the Son of Man, the Son of Man and Son of God was going through a certain phase of trial of the Spirit. One time I told people that many people know of the blood that was shed at Calvary. They know of the wounding of our transgressions, the bruising of our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace. But many people do not know the blood in Gethsemane. They don't understand the bleeding of the minister, the servant and the man of God, aligning himself to the assignment of God and the equal price that comes with it. Some people think that you just wake up and you become a man of God. Or a woman of God. Or not at least in your own version, but in the true version of the Spirit, the attestations. Somebody said hallelujah. When Jesus was talking to the disciples, he gave his blood and he said, this is my blood in the new covenant. The blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ spells the new covenant. His blood is somewhere in there. Praise God. His blood is somewhere in there. How many of you know that the transition of the blood of the New Testament dispensation of the new covenant is different from the old and it's both blood. There is a blood that was shed for the remission of your sin and the healing of your diseases because of the fallen nature that you had. You understand what I'm saying? You are only flesh, a living soul. He says that he breathed into man the breath of life and he became a living soul. That's the first Adamic. He says that the first Adamic was a living soul. But the second Adam, he says, was a life-giving spirit. He was a quickening spirit. The first Adam was a natural man. The second Adam was a spiritual man. He was spirit. He says, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Somebody shout hallelujah. But the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the new covenant, the, the new covenant is after the blood of Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. So when you transition from simply a believer to a minister, you must understand the experience. You must understand what the cup is. At one point, you will be pushed to give up. Of course, if you're not a minister on the front line, you will never understand it. Men can be wicked. You understand? Men can be so wicked. People can be so wicked. That if you do not know who calls you, you can compromise. Or you can even give in the town. I wish some of you go and, and do a research of how many ministers or believers are quitting the faith. Ministers that are putting down the plow and laying down the Bible and walking away. 
And 99% the reason is fellow ministers. It's not non-believers. No. It's men with a Torah. You're following what I'm trying to say? But when you know who called you, praise God. The Bible says in Peter that he has called us to glory. He's called us to glory. Tell yourself I've been called to glory. So the Son of God bled. He bled. In prayer, he bled. But there was a reason, there was a connotation to that bleeding. But back to the point. Jacob is going to meet his brother. And he gets to the point where he knows that there is something he must get from God alone. There's a certain consecration he must undergo before God. If he has to face the man who now is his enemy, yet was a brother. Are you hearing me? And the Bible says this man comes in the night. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man started to fight, he realizes that Jacob was a stickler. He, he fought to, he persisted. And the man knew that this guy was not going to give up. Praise God. And what happens? The man touches the hollow of Jacob's thigh. You remember that? And the fight continues. The man tells Jacob, let me go. And Jacob tells the man, I will not let you go until you bless me. Are you hearing me? Listen, this is how the blessing comes. The man asks him, what is thy name? I will not let you go until you bless me. What is thy name? And he says, my name is Jacob. Praise God. And he says, thy name shall be no more called Jacob, supplanter, but Israel. God has prevailed. Israel means God has prevailed. Right? For as a prince has thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. So he says, from today, O Israel. That was the blessing. Yeah? Are you hearing me? Some people think the blessing is driving a nice car. Some people think the blessing is sleeping in a very nice house. Some people think the blessing is, is having a very nice family. All of that follows the blessing. This was the real blessing. He changed his name. Somebody shout hallelujah. He changed his name. He told him from today you are not Jacob, but thou art Israel, for thou hast contended with man and God and prevailed. Israel means God prevailed. You understand? Now Jacob is saying, oh, okay, what is your name too? Tell me your name too. Tell me your name. The New Living Translation, uh-huh. Please tell me your name. And Jacob said, why do you want to know? The, the man now asked, why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Praise God. Somebody shout Hallelujah. And this man, which now we realize is a typification and representation and truly was God, because he tells them, for you have fought with God and won. This man was God. Are you following me? God refuses to introduce himself to this Jacob by name. But yet he blesses him and changes Jacob's name. Are you following what I'm saying? God refused to tell Jacob his name, but then he blesses Jacob by changing his name. Are you following me? There is nothing in this world that releases you into the abundance of the Spirit like the name you're given. Revelations 2.17 says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And to him that overcometh, he says, Will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. And in the stone, he says, A new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Ask your neighbor, what is your name? What changed the life and destiny of this man was when God gave him a name. 
when God gave him a name. That's why I told you, the wilderness experience is there to kill you. So you're dead to the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, the praises of men, the, the attention of this world. First, because firstly you must die. You must die. Otherwise, the day you get anointed, oh my God, the way you enter, everybody would know that you're anointed. You understand what I'm saying? The day you open a blind eye, oh, make a lame man walk, everybody will know that you're the one. You understand? But you see, that character in God kills you, even when you have a lot of influence in the spirit. You die to many things. The things that lower and take people off the course don't take you off. Because you're a dead man. Dead men don't respond to gold and silver. They don't. Dead men don't last. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Dead men don't contend. They don't fight. Dead men don't strive. So he kills you. He starts also to teach you. Praise God. He teaches you himself. He speaks to you so vividly. The spirit of revelation rests on your life so distinctly. That's the distinction of the spirit. That's the voice and the sound. It sits on your life. You understand? Then it tests you into maturity. He lets certain people or things around you start to test your maturity. How will you respond in spite of the pressures that are coming your way? Jacob, how will you respond when you're serving Laban? David, how will you respond when you're serving Saul? How will you respond when you're abandoned? How will you respond when you lack? How will you respond when things are not working the way you want them to work, but yet you're truly a man or a woman of God? And Paul says, uh-uh, none of us has been tempted to what? To the shedding of blood. That means the blood in Gethsemane is not a test station. <laughs> but you see, he is with the same, the Bible says, he's ever with the same temptation. To make a way out for you. And believe me, many Christians fail at the level of maturity. When the things that attack you want to test how mature you are, and then you choose to respond like a babe. Some people, the only distance between them and their success is anger and unforgiveness. Some people, the distance between them and their success is gossip and slander. Some people between them and their success is simply ignoring the principles of God. Simple principles of God. This is a generation that believes in miracle money and it does not believe in the principles of tithes and giving and your first fruits and all these things the scriptures teach. He just think somehow God is, did you understand it? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And you repeat it and the person hears it and he says, uh uh, me God has to bless me my way. <laughs> Keep trying, sir. Keep trying, woman of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you become stiff-necked, you start resisting the spirit. And it's easy. The man says, you stiff-necked people, which of the prophets did you not persecute? Why do you resist the Holy Spirit? Do you understand? This place of maturity allows the temptations that come to and you say, you know what, God? Let me tell you. There is no place of maturity like the place where everything in you is ready to give in to what is not godly and you choose to do good. That's mature. That's why he says, little children, if you're overcome by sin, you see, those are babes, the pills, the spiritual babies, they fall for everything. But as you continue to grow, you learn to say, mm -mm, no! And God finds that honorable. Somebody shout hallelujah. The consecration comes through of the spirit. The sanctification unto obedience. The separation of your conscience. And this purification. To walk void of offense toward God and man. You understand? And all these things are happening as you're commissioned by God. I always say that. But most importantly, remember one time I told you, I said... At one particular point when you're ready to be used by God, somehow, somewhere, he'll give you a name. 
Abraham, right? He was Abraham, right? Exalted father. He encounters God. His name changes and God uses him. You see? There are people in scripture, some their names we got to know. Some their names, they were called by the names that, that the spirit chose to call them. But I have known this for a fact that every man and woman who encounters God is called a certain way by God. Some beside hallelujah. That's the new name on the white stone. That's an overcomer. One that has the ear to hear what the spirit says. The voice behind the obvious things men read in the things of the spirit. God gives you the grace to start to read to understand way deeper than many men can articulate. Yes, men read the Bible, but you read it differently. Men read the scriptures, they sit under the words, they go and they study, you understand? They, they have a philosophical idea about fields, that's okay. But you see, God wants to take you beyond that to a place of understanding him that you may know him. This is eternal life, that they might know the one true God and his only son, Jesus. But just beyond the philosophical, you will know him in the person. Praise God. You will know him, even as he knows you. And he says, and they that know their God, what will they do? Yes. You can only function as far as the God you know. Somebody shout hallelujah. There is no shortcut. Stop thinking that people have to be available to share their gods. He has to get to a point where he becomes your God. Somebody said hallelujah. You have to, have to get to a point where he becomes personal. He becomes personal. Now God refuses to introduce himself to this man. He refuses to tell him his name. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Either way the man is blessed. So he faces Esau. He meets Esau. The man who was expecting a sword received love and mercy. Forgiveness and reconciliation. He brings gifts to Esau. Esau refuses them and Esau wants to even give him more. The man who is not the blessed. The one who has not God's favor. Was way richer. At that particular point. Then the guy coming to make peace with him. Why? Because like I told you, there's a grace for the man who works hard. Don't think that because you're under grace, you're just going to see it, and then everything happens for you. Because you're under grace, like miracles are just supposed to be there. No, there are principles too. But look at it. Work hard. Praise God. Now, the peace and reconciliation is there. Jacob's biggest fear has been dealt with. He has encountered God's intervention in his life. What happens? In Genesis 33, again where we're at, in verse 17, immediately after the success, the Bible says, Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made boots for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. And Jacob, the Bible says, came to Salem. Salem means peace. That means God had given him peace over his enemies. Are you hearing me? He came to Salem, uh, which is a city of Sechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paddan Aram. And he pitched his tent before the city. And what happened? And he brought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent and the hand of the children of Hamor and Sechem's father for a hundred pieces of money. And he, the Bible says, erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. El Elohe Israel. Israel, the mighty God of Israel, who has understood it. What's your name? What is your name? He asks. Are you hearing me? Why do you want to know my name? I've blessed you. You want to know my name, but without a testimony. You want to know my name, but without a testimony. How will I connect with you without a certain experience? The experience has to define me a certain way. So when, when I call a certain name, you understand what I mean. I was the God of Abraham. He had an experience. I was the God of your father Isaac. He had an experience. You don't have an experience, but you want to know me. Get the blessing. Get the experience first. When you get the experience, you will know me. The man gets the experience. After getting the experience, he becomes the God of Israel. 
Oh, I've changed your name. You're no longer Jacob, but thou art Israel, for thou hast fought with man and God and prevailed. And then you go with man, and then you prevail over Esau, and then he's no longer God, but he's the God of Rebekah. Who is understanding what I'm saying? Israel, Jacob, came to the ultimate revelation that God never simply wanted to carry a title without himself attached to the man. Ooh. He now calls him the God of Israel. It's like you saying your name. What's your name? Yes. And I said, the God of? Yes. That is God. <laughs> In Exodus chapter 3 verse 6, God appears to Abraham. Remember? You understand? He, uh, Moses, sorry. He appears to Moses. He says, moreover, he says, I am, listen, I am, he's telling who? Moses. Follow me. He says, I am the God of thy father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And the Bible says, Moses hid himself, his faith, for he was afraid to look upon this God. Are you hearing me? Then Moses starts a conversation with Jehovah God. Verse 13, as he is now talking with God, Moses says unto God, Behold, when I come into the children of Israel, they shall say unto me, The God of your father hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them when I go there? What will I say unto them? Who has sent me? Are you hearing me? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am, but which I am. The God of... Uh. Some people only end up calling him the great I am. But they don't understand. I am is incomplete. <laughs> Otherwise I am. You are. They are. Even the unbelievers are. But there is something that makes this I am greater than any I am. Somebody shout hallelujah. Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am had sent me to you. And God, he repeats it again. He realizes this guy doesn't get it. He says, and God, moreover, said unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, that the God of your fathers, he has repeated it again in the very chapter. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. That is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. When he later comes in the next chapter, and, and then he's talking with God, he says, but I cannot talk, I, I stammer. He says, ah, Aaron shall be thy lips. For he shall be unto your lips, and you shall be unto him God. Why? Moses doesn't understand that he wants him, God wants him, to stand before Pharaoh and simply say, he is my God. No, 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 you read the scripture. He says, I am. Tell them I am I sent you. Let me probably repeat it to you because I know you didn't understand. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Moses, own me when you're introducing yourself. Just simply own me and say that you're not alone. I am with you. I am with you. I just simply own me. The God of Grace Lubega. Come on, you can put your name. Who has understood what I just said? I mean... If God can own a road, you remember the road that was put down? Become a serpent? And then later, he held it, turned into a road again? In Genesis 34, the Bible says when Moses gets off now to go to Egypt, the Bible says he carried the road of God. It became the road of God because God exercised power on it. How much more? You who has been filled by the Holy Ghost. You who has the Son of God in you. In whom you live, move, and have your own being. 
God is trying to tell you and I something. I am the God of you. He is the God of me. Learn to own God. Learn to own God. Don't look at him as this God who is so far from you. No. He is my God. That is the God of Isaac. The God of Jacob. The God of Abraham. The God of Grace The God of Peter. The God of Mark. The God of Moses. The God of Paul. The God of, 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 the God of. He wants to share his identity with you. He didn't want you to enter that interview alone. Uh -uh. He didn't want you to enter that marriage alone. Uh -uh. He doesn't want you to enter that ministry alone. Uh -uh. He doesn't want you to enter that office alone. Uh -uh. He says, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Don't just enter alone. No, I am with you. Simply say, I am here with my God. Before that, he had never been called the God of Israel. The first time he becomes the God of Israel is when Israel said, He's the God of Israel. Who has understood what I just said? <laughs> Did you understand what I just said? The day he becomes the God of Israel is the day Israel, and remember, he didn't say the God of Jacob, the trickster, the supplanter. He's not the God of failure. He's not the God of disadvantage. He's not the God of wastage. He's not the God of profanity. He's not the God of weakness. He's not the God of perversion. He's not the God of sickness. Uh -uh. He went to the name that was given him, and then he says, uh -uh. he's the God of the name that was given me. That means that the name that I carry by God, I carry by him, and he owns it too, to see it to fulfillment in the spirit before I call on his name. You must have a name. Yes, you're Peter. That's all right. Yes, you're Rhoda. That's all right. But there has to be another name. Huh? It's not that one which you can tell people. Don't be mistaken. You know some person, you know the Lord in a vision told me you are, you are Mukutula and you get a break of chains. No. I'm not talking about something your human language and tongue can articulate. No. I'm talking about something that you might not be able to call with your own mouth, but you know that when he calls you, you know that even if you sit at a meeting, 10,000 people, when he's speaking to you, there is a name he calls and you can turn and say, I Kata, my God. That's the blessing. That's the real blessing when God calls you by a certain name. There are things that look so big but they can become too small when you know the God who wants to own you and the God who wants you to own him. He wants you to have that love with him, that relationship where he, he's your God and, and when you call on him, he, he's truly yours. He's yours. I wish I could explain deeper what I mean when I say my God. It's not an expression of surprise. It's not simply supposed to be an exclamation. It's not simply supposed to be a figure of speech. It's supposed to be a personal experience. I know him. This time I am calling him. When you get to that level, you don't need to say many things. Because you know how to talk to him. That is why many of you can't pray. Because God is not yet personal. He's up there, you love him. You believe in him and serve him. But he's not, let me tell you. God loves to reveal himself through people. He's named for himself. That is the only reason I know that I will never fail. I know that it doesn't matter what happens, what they say, what they think, what they, I know because I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. I saw God. 
I know him. They also have their own version of their God. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Rebecca Grace, that one. Ah, somebody receive it. You have to get to a point when nothing threatens you. Because you know who you believe. Nothing makes you lose peace and appetite. Because you know who you believe. Things can happen. You can go through challenges. One thing leads to another. One frustration leads to another. Yes, you are born as Jacob. You are a supplanter. You are a trickster. You are disadvantaged. You are a wicked, broken guy. That's okay. But encounter this God. He'll give you another name. And how amazing that the name goes with the hidden man. That means you start accessing the hidden things of God. There are things, I was sharing this and I told people, there are things in God that are unsearchable. There are things that are not in the realm of seek and you shall find. No. He says, I shall show you, pray to me. Pray to me. And I shall show you great and unsearchable things. Things which you could not know for yourself. There are things that they are not searchable. They are, they are for yielded spirits to a God they know. That you might know him even as he knows you. The Bible says. That you may know him even as he knows you. You're given a function. You're given an identity. But you're given a name. Those three things are the true qualifications of a man commissioned by God. If you don't have a name, it doesn't matter what title you carry. Even if you're called bishop or evangelist, or pastor, apostle, prophet, reverend, you call anything. That's all right. But until you have a certain name, until, until you have a certain identity, until your function. The, the, the Bible calls it part and lot. You remember Simon the Caesar when he was going to buy the miracle? God told him you have no part, no lot in this matter. He didn't have a part in the gospel. He, he was a man ministering. He was a man walking with the ministers. He was a man who was born again. But he did not have a part in the gospel. He didn't have a lot. That is why when we get to the book of Revelation, if a man adds or subtracts, the Bible says his name, his part is rubbed, his part, literally. You, because it's not a book of Revelation, it's a book of Revelation. It's the spirit of Revelation. To frustrate the spirit of Revelation, your part is not there. You're all believers, we're all believers, but you must know your part. You must know your part, your your lot, you must, man, man, when you are planted in your path, when you finally realize where you fit, everything will start working for good to them that love the Lord, but are also called according to his purpose, not according to their purpose, not according to the assumed purpose, not according to the confined purpose of them ahead of them. I'm not talking about what a man called you, because he thought you're it. I'm not about what you called yourself because you thought you're it. I'm talking about what God called you according to his purpose. What is your name? That's a true blessing. That is how I know when God talks, I know that he's talking to me. Because he talks to me a certain way. That is how I know that he, he has spoken. I, I am sure that he has spoken. I might never be able to explain it. No, judge the wisdom. But you see, it's more than that. The wisdom is sacred, but it's deeper than that. It's more than the things I will speak. It's, 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 it's when you know he's yours. Do you understand? You worship him as yours. You praise him as yours. You serve him as yours. You count all but lost for the excellence of that knowledge for whom you count all things but done that you may win him. Because that's the excellence of knowledge. That the Lord gives wisdom to him that has that knowledge. It, it starts to, to work in the foundation of your spirit. It starts to define your way of life. It starts to put you at a place. Man, one time the Lord told me many people die without even doing a quarter of their part in the gospel. 
and they die like mere men. And many of them will never know because they became so comfortable early. They settled for what they thought was victory and, and glory, yet in its own it was nothing. It was, it was, it was callous, it was fleshly, it was religious, it was carnal. It was, it was only to the end of how far men knew God. But this is the point where you have to know God personally. To know him personally. Oh, I wish I can explain more in language. But sometimes I don't know how to, to explain this reality. Of course, for some of you, the Spirit of God is giving certain lights, but it's more than I can ever express. God is real. There is somebody who can even walk out of salvation. They've been serving God, they've been believing God, they've been doing everything. But at one time, something happened, and like, you know what? I've given up on this thing called salvation. Ah, you have not seen him. How can you give up on a man? How can you give up on that God when you see him a certain way? How? How can you lose a function? How can you not function when you don't when you have a name with him? This is more than what men call you or what you will call yourself. This is like the secret code of access to that person of God. That every time you're praying and talking with him, there is a way he calls you. And he says, For I have called thee by name. He didn't mean by your name, the one your mother and father gave you. No. Even Jesus was the Christ of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? When he says, I've called you by name, he's not talking about the name your mother gave you. No. Or your father. No. Deeper than that. He's talking about the name he called you by himself. That place where he wants to relate with you a certain way. Do you understand what I'm saying? God has to become person. Tell your neighbor he has to become person. From the day I understood my name by God, which I cannot say because I can't articulate it in human language, but from the time I got a certain identity with God, something so special happened in my life. And it was how the distinctions of the call of my life started to become clearer. What do I mean by that? There are many, many ministers of the gospel. And every man God has ordained a different distinction. You understand what I'm saying? But he, he takes you to a point where he will prove to you that this is your part. This is your part. Men will preach, but they'll never preach like me. They'll never preach like me. I know it. I'll always have my distinction. And every man of God has their own distinction. That's what makes us special. That's what makes us different. Every woman, every person here has their own distinction. You might never stand on my pulpit or any pulpit. You might never be a preacher. You might even never be a worshiper. Oh, but whatever the Lord has given you, it shall carry its own distinction that defines the identity of the special assignment God has placed on your life. And when you find that, the anointing starts to move on your life so mighty. I don't need to pray for the Spirit to move. He's already moving. Why? Because I carry my distinction. I don't need to scream for the miraculous to happen. Why? Because I carry my distinction. It's no longer the seeking and strife to pursue him. It's the love that every morning reminds me that he pursued me through Christ. And every time I yield to that love, I find that it's not the man seeking the message. It's the message seeking the man. It's the faith to open your lips. And he fills it with good things. It's not you seeking, it's him seeking. He loves you enough. God wants to give you more than you, he wants you to give him. That's the thing Martha didn't understand. She's in the kitchen cooking. And Mary's receiving from the master. She has sat at the feet. And he says, Mary has received something. And nobody shall take it away from her. For she chose, the Bible says, the better part. The good part. 
The Bible says she chose the good part. God is more interested in giving to you. And out of that abundance, you now allow him to work through you. So I can't lay claim on Fanero. I can't lay claim on the miracles. I can't lay claim on the wonder. Because it is God which worketh in me, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And just this guy who knows I possess that treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of power might be of God and not of man. The sufficiency is not of us as of to think of anything by us, but the sufficiency is of God which has made us able ministers of the covenant. Are you hearing me? Now let me speak to Africa, Uganda, specifically Uganda. I carry tears that there are nations that are seeking for the same God we as a nation are rejecting. He's so over our nation, so over this land. You can feel him. You can feel him. He's had a covenant with us. Go East African Revival. Go as far. They will tell you there is nothing as big as East African Revival on the African continent. He has always had a covenant with this nation. We have it. We have it. It's only that every generation sort of meets him and somewhere finds its own way through other things and loses him along the way. But he has always been strong on our land. And whether you wake up now or you wake up 10 years to come or 20, the later you wake up, the more you'll know that you were simply late. But God has started a work on this land that nobody can stop. Nobody can stop. Are you hearing me? And I feel that he's doing something on our continent. The first indeed shall be last. But that ain't mean that other men can't call on him and he moves. No. Let America call on him, he will move. Let Asia call on him and we will move. But this is what I know for certain. The God of Uganda is serious about this thing. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? That's why I tell young people, let us stop simply seeking. Let us deeply seek God. Stop simply praying. Huh? Stop having options and no, 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 no. He says, you will find me if you seek me with your heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't seek as one who was never found. Seek as one who was found by him. Don't forget the door that you knock. Don't talk about the knocking and forget the door that you knock. The door is Jesus. Jesus is the reason for our action. He found us first. We love him because he loved us first. Somebody shout hallelujah. You need a name. That's the true blessing of God and a man's life. Listen, you can lose everything in this world. You can have or not have, that's all right. There are things people in this world can have even without having God. But there is this one thing that is ever a constant for every child of God. You must know the name by which God calls you. You must own your God. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. He must be my God. God told me, that a time will come, or is the coming, way quicker than we ever thought, where they are going to start fearing Christians again. Some people think they can talk about us anyway. They think they can abuse us anyway. They can, you know, turn, you know, vengeance of the Lord. But a time is coming where the glory of God upon our lives, your life, no man will easily open their mouth to speak about you evil. Not because you cast them, no. But the glory on you is enough to wear their words. And every tongue that rises against you, you shall condemn. Do you know that lately governments don't even recognize the voice of Christianity anymore? Go to the United States. Many men used to have big churches, but 
There were not a voice in their own nation. The government would not listen. Political would not listen. Leaders would not listen to them. Why? Because every time they open their mouth, they are opening politics. We are men of God. We are not politicians. We are men of God. We are not politicians. We have to get to the point where even our governments come to us and seek advice on their policy. Because they know when a Christian gives an opinion, it is real. We have to be the answer in hospitals, the answer in schools, the answer in universities, the answers at our workplace. Those things of being Christians at your workplace and you look like an unbeliever, you're even worse dealing with Bill Weeds than a Muslim. Ah! Praise God, somebody. That is why I tell people, Fanera is not a mob, it's an army. We are up to something. When you're working, work hard. When you're serving, serve hard. When you, whatever you do, do it with all your strength. Why? Because we are on a mission. They must see our God. Make us proud. I tell the students, don't pass. Excel. Let them keep talking. You just continue excelling. The time will come when it's undoubtable. Uh-uh. The world's future leaders are here. I know it. I know it. I know it. Why? Because you have a name with God. There's somebody probably are working a 5, 8 a.m. job and things are not yet working. Huh? You're striving. You're waking up every morning. You don't know God. You know, there's nothing. No, no. Hang in there. Hang in there. It is coming. Something will change for you. Why? Because you're not simply in the gospel and church for your own personal pursuit. No. Don't lose hope. Believe God. Believe God. If you examine yourself and you feel that you don't have a name with God, ask for it. Ask for it. Ask for it. He's the God of Jacob, but he's also the God of Israel. Are you hearing me? The Bible says he sent a word to Jacob. And he was lit up Israel, the spiritual man. Are you hearing me? Somebody raise your hands and speak to God. Man, I feel the presence of God here. I feel the presence of God here. I feel the presence of God here. The Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God is moving. The true blessing is the name change. You need a name. Come on, talk to God. Take a minute. Body, I want you to touch where it's painting right now. In the mind.
mighty name of Jesus. I rebuke and bind and destroy that spirit of infirmity and disease. I command that spirit of infirmity to lose you and leave you now. In Jesus' name, you're healed. Now, let me pronounce some words upon your life. In the name of Jesus, you have a name. You have a name. And it is known by you and God. In the name of Jesus. He's the God of that name. He owns you. He's with you. He loves you. He will never leave you. Nor forsake you. What I sense in my spirit to tell you. I see that many of you are entering into a grace of miracles, signs, and wonders. The spirit will be mighty on you. The anointing will be mighty on you. The favor of God will be mighty on you. The power of God will be mighty on you. It doesn't matter whether they don't understand it. He will never stop moving upon you. Receive it! Give the Lord a mighty hand of a praise. You're going upward and upward only from glory to glory in the mighty name of Jesus. It does not matter the present limitations. Those cannot be compared to the glory that pursues you. You're going to shine and you're shining brighter and you're seeing God deeper this week, this year, tonight in the name of Jesus. And even better, because of what Christ did, you will not live in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Now, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to come and receive him as your Lord and Savior. He loves you. Come and receive the name above every name. That at the sound of that name, every knee bows and every tongue confesses of the things in the earth and of the things under earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Come and receive that name. Come and receive that name. Wow. Heaven is celebrating. Heaven is celebrating. You're going to repeat these words after me. Fellow Jesus, tonight I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died and rose again for me. You belong to me, and I'm yours. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.